Thank you, June. Turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to 1 Timothy chapter 1 again. If you don't have your Bible, it's in your bulletin. Uh, on the back of the congregational reading, our text for this morning. What, um, what the pastoral letters will make increasingly clear is that the church of Jesus Christ has been entrusted with a message that is only suitable for one group of people, sinners. Those that don't like to think of themselves that way or recognize their own spiritual bankruptcy before God should feel, if the gospel's being proclaimed, extremely uncomfortable then in or around the church. Only those increasingly aware of their need for Jesus Christ to be both their forgiveness and their righteousness should feel comfortable in the church because everything with which the church has been entrusted and called to do is in accordance with the gospel, which is a message for sinners. Even the old covenant law must now submit to the church's message in the gospel. The law was brought in to reveal, we're finding as we read through the Bible, exactly what it was that the curse did to humanity in Genesis. It made us unable to obey or to please God. The law comes in to remind us of this all the time while the gospel comes in to save us from this fact. Instead, in Ephesus, where Timothy is, to whom this letter is being written, teachers of the law have arisen as though the church needs those who's bent towards speculation about what God accepts and why God will actually forgive and what we should actually do are wreaking havoc on the church. And the one who is under the command of God to be his apostle, Paul, will not have it. And so in the second half of chapter one this morning, Paul is going to expound on the centrality of the gospel message and get to the core of just what it is that we're seeing revealed in it. Why is it such a big deal to make sure nothing interrupts its centrality? In these verses, beloved, this morning is really the heart of the whole Christian message. The one thing the church has been left here to proclaim from the rooftops and the mountaintops of the world. What if the whole purpose of creation all along was to give God a theater to display his amazing grace so that the sinners that grace saves will glorify him forever for his mercy. I think that's precisely what the whole of scripture teaches. It's summarized so many times for us clearly, beautifully for us in texts like um, Genesis 2, 3, all the way back in the beginning, Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Psalm 2, Zephaniah 3, 9, Romans 9, 22 and 23, Ephesians 3, 8 through 11, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. What if that's why clarifying these things for the church is so important to Paul? Because it's the main reason for which the world was created. The church was the people God had planned all along from eternity past to finally reveal what his purpose was in creating the world. That's why gospel centrality is worth fighting for and dying for, if need be, in the church. The gospel finally makes God, our creator, known for who he actually is. Through his mercy, Jesus wants the world to know how patient he is with the worst of us. That is why the church exists. And anything in the church that would threaten the clarity or purity of that message must be silenced or people will be destroyed. So let's pray. Father, for your name, God, for your glory, for your purpose, for your word, for your son, for your people, have mercy on me, a sinner. Please make me speak the truth. I ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me read verses 12 and just the front part of 13 to start. 1 Timothy 1. Paul says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly, 
I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. So writing to Timothy about the gospel of the glory of the blessed God turns Paul's eyes upward to God. Paul credits Jesus for his insight, his passion in this ministry because Paul didn't have any of those things prior to Jesus interrupting his life on the Damascus road and saving him. Most of us probably know the story of Paul's rescue, his conversion in Acts 9. Saul was not searching for God. He was not searching for salvation on the road to Damascus. He's going after Christians to imprison them. That's precisely what he was doing. He refers to his former self as a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent of Jesus and the gospel. Those are very strong words for a man whose zeal for God in that life, zeal for God, was unmatched, whose obedience to the law, as he will say later in Philippians 3, was blameless. Blasphemer? That's actually what he was? Paul understood things about his former self now that he didn't know at the time. He thought he was on God's side while persecuting Christians, but it turns out in his hatred for believers, he was blaspheming the very God he claimed to worship, to reject Christ, Paul now knows. To oppose the gospel is to blaspheme against what God says is true, even if in that you are passionate for God, which Paul certainly was, more than any human being probably that ever lived, literally. And that was Paul's history. When we pick up on Paul's story in Acts 9, we won't read it today, but after he had gladly kept watch over the garments of those who needed free hands to stone the disciple of Jesus named Stephen in Acts 7, stoned him to death. When the text picks back up with him in Acts 9, he was, quote, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Paul was the top of the food chain in Pharisaism. He went to the high priest asking for letters to be written that he could take to the Jewish synagogues in Damascus in Syria so that if anyone found someone or knew someone in those synagogues who was a believer in Christ, Paul could arrest them, bring them back to Jerusalem for trial to suffer the exact same fate as Stephen had. Paul hated the very name of Jesus. He hated him. He hated anyone who believed in him for salvation. Paul literally wanted to put an end to Christianity once and for all. He had set himself against the name of Jesus as his arch rival. So it wasn't like he lived neutrally, just didn't care about Jesus. He hated Jesus, was on a quest to stop Jesus and everything about him. What does Jesus do to people who act like that? What does he do to people who act so ignorantly, so arrogantly in their unbelief? Verse 13 in the middle, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Look at that word overflowed, overflowed. On his way to capture and eventually kill people, who claimed the name of Jesus in Acts 9, Paul was steamrolled by the grace of God. How did Paul become the missionary, the missionary really, to the Gentiles, to non-Jewish peoples? Why was he so passionate about the name of Christ and the gospel? Because Paul never stopped smelling the smoke of the fire in which he deserved to burn, and he knew it. He knew what he was. He knew what he should have gotten from God. But he received mercy because he had acted ignorantly in his unbelief. He didn't know that he was a wretch. And God was merciful to a man like that. The same Jesus he meant to kill caught him on the way and brought him to the table for a feast the grace of God, Paul says, overflowed because that's what it would take to save a man like Paul, an overflow of grace. The grace of God overflowed for him in a tide of the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. The gospel is what saved Paul. And as you'll notice here, verses 12 through 17, Paul's testimony um, just build until Paul will eventually explode in worship. That's where this is headed. Look at verse 15. 
the saying is trustworthy. So there's a saying out there that's being said. And he says the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Here's what is true and reliable, he's saying. Here's what you can bank on. And if anybody knows it, Paul knows it. This Christ Jesus, he came into the world to save sinners because Paul is saved and Paul is the foremost. He's the worst one. And at one time, Paul was on his way to greatness in the world. His devotion for and obedience to God were unmatched as a zealous dedicated, devoted, morally upright Pharisee. Why would God change a man like that? Isn't that the goal? What does a man like that need saving from? That was his sinfulness? That's what made him wretched? Then an overflow of grace buried that man, whose name had been Saul, as a matter of fact, buried him in the ground and raised a new man in his place named Paul. And Paul was not the chief of the Pharisees. Paul was the chief of sinners. What does Paul mean when he says, of whom I am the foremost? Does he mean he quantitatively, numerically committed more sins than anyone? That he was more disobedient than anyone? No, it's interesting that it's quite the contrary because this isn't hyperbole. Like he's not just saying it to say it. Grace doesn't create arrogant rebels. It creates people who know exactly what they really are. Paul means, first of all, that his salvation is so unlikely and so undeserved, so unearned, that God's grace is more amazing than anyone is really in a position to grasp. Paul has grown so close to Jesus over these years that he can see himself clearly. That's what he's saying. He knows he has no business setting foot anywhere near the throne of God, let alone having a seat of honor at his table, and it still overwhelms him when he thinks on it because he should be dead for his blasphemy. You hear what Paul is saying with that phrase, chief of sinners? He's saying nobody deserves condemnation more than me. But Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, it turns out. This saying is trustworthy, which means to this day, every sinner in this room needs to hear this statement because you can take it to the bank. Jesus Christ came into the world to save what we think keeps us from God. Sinners. Is that what you are? I didn't ask if that's what you were, because that's not how Paul's speaking. I asked if that's what you are, because you have to be that in order to be saved. If that's what you are, I have good news. Look at verse 16. But I received mercy for this reason. So here's why such a blaspheming, insolent opponent received mercy. That in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Perfect patience. Paul is so precise. Why was Jesus so merciful to Paul? Paul is the chief of sinners, the most guilty man alive. That's why Jesus was merciful to Paul. Do you believe this? Who is this God that we sing and speak about? Who is he? This is what he's like? Everybody thinks they know what God is like. We've all created him, an idea of him in our heads, and that's how we live for him or against him, based on the idea we have of him in our heads. And then the Bible comes along and reveals 
That until we know that he's a savior of the worst of us, we really have no clue who God is, no matter what we know about him. Paul was so unfamiliar with the God who was that in following him and being committed to his law, he was a blasphemer. My goodness, do we believe the words in this text? Do we believe them? Paul's wretchedness as a blasphemer and persecutor and insolent opponent was precisely why Jesus showed him mercy. So that the one who was entrusted most with the spread of the gospel beyond the borders of Jerusalem would technically be the most, if you wanted to get technical about it, irredeemable of sinners. It was entrusted to him to carry this message to the nations. I wonder why that is. Because then, if that's the way it is, that the one entrusted most with the spread of the gospel from the borders of Jerusalem would be the most irredeemable of sinners because then the extent, the expanse, the height and the breadth and the length and the depth of the patience of Jesus toward wretches would be most clearly known. See, God picked the one that was furthest from him to be the main one to bring this message outside of Jerusalem. And it is no small thing that the one farthest from him was a religious, devoted, upstanding, morally upright person. Jesus did it this way so that what the message of the gospel truly is would be as clear as day because I think we honestly have it in our heads that you do have to be a little bit better than others to be worthy of this salvation. You have to at least not be as bad as such and such or that group or that person really if you want to be saved or want to be a part of the church. But we exist for the same reason And in the same way, or we aren't a church at all. We're here to tell the truth about things. The truth. You say, well, am I just supposed to be really bad on purpose then? That question means we don't know yet, yet, what sinfulness really is. Right? Because we assume that sinfulness is always dirty, right? We we never realize that our cleanliness can be as much an affront to God as our filthiness, right? We, We don't talk about repenting of our righteousness, right? We won't need any help looking like we need Jesus if we stop trying to look like something we're not. It isn't a contest to see who can be the most wicked. The fact is, is that everybody is wicked. Most people just aren't willing to admit it. And you say, well, I'm not wicked. I don't do. Paul was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent. And I'll bet you anything, he was more what we're all trying to be than any of us ever could hope to be, outwardly. So don't just think of sinfulness in terms of dirty things. Think of sinfulness as anything, good or bad, that rejects the necessity of Christ to save me. It's It's not our struggle with sin that ruins our witness, beloved. How could that be if the message is for sinners Why do we think we have a message if we look like we don't need Jesus? Again, you're you're not trying to be wicked. We are. It's our pretense that hurts our witness. It's this idea we have that to look really good, you have to look really good to be a Christian. That tells people that don't look really good they're not welcome. 
when, when, when that's the message, that, that what makes me a Christian, what saves me, what gets God's approval is my good behavior, even now that I'm saved, when that's the message, then when we fall and it's not a sin we can hide, then the world says, see, I told you, they're hypocrites, it's a joke. But if the testimony is always, look, I'm a sinner, I promise you, in need of grace, then when you fall, it points to Christ as Savior. He still lets you at the table rather than you as performer. Because Jesus Christ isn't hiding the fact that he's perfectly patient with sinners. He isn't hiding that. He doesn't come to us as though he's not. And we wag our finger in the face of the world like if they don't get it together, they're not going to get in. We're crazy if we do that. He isn't keeping it a secret that he's like this. That he's just going to keep being patient. He doesn't keep that a secret. We think you can't tell people who he really is or they'll take advantage of him. There's nothing more self-righteous than thinking you can do a better job proclaiming the truth than Jesus did in his word. In the salvation of people that don't deserve it, he's putting his perfect patience on full display. Jesus is saying, look, look at what I do for the worst of you. I have come to save you. I've come to forgive you. I've come to make you clean and holy and call you my very own. Oh, you're poor? You have nothing? You have no money? You have no righteousness? You have no goodness? Good, because it's all free. It's all for you. I'm talking to everybody in the room this morning. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to everybody watching later on YouTube or wherever. I don't know. Church, that's who we are. You see, that, that's what it means to be a church. Mercy for the arrogant, insolent, violent, wretched Christian killer means that Jesus Christ is more patient than human words or pictures or songs will ever be capable of describing. Sing them anyway, paint them anyway, no question. They honor him, but they don't capture him. Hear the good news. Hear it. It will take perfect patience to save the chief of sinners. And that's precisely how patient Jesus is. Just imagine such a thing. Perfect patience. See, that doesn't run out if it's perfect. The hands holding your salvation, beloved, they will never let you go. We spend our whole lives probably, probably, wishing that we did better, right? That we were more. And I, 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 I understand that. I, I think I do. And one of the things all of us learn to become over time living in this world, if there's anything we learn to become, it's impatient, right? Because people will usually prove they're not worth waiting for. And they love to make us wait, right? People will give us plenty of reasons to give up hope in humanity, right? You will give you, I will give me enough reasons to throw up our hands and quit. But the patience of Jesus is perfect. Perfect. It's complete. It's whole. It's enduring and never ending. It never stops. It never quits. It never falters. It never fails. Fall for the 10 millionth time and come. It is still perfect. 
And this perfect patience that accomplishes everything for which it is patient with us in the first place can never be tested beyond its limit. When you disobey him and fail for the 10,000th time, the patience holds because you can't chip away at the patience of Jesus. We can chip away at another's patience. We do. People we don't know chip away at our patience. Much more the people we do know that we are in relationships with. But Jesus is not a rock that's steadily worn down by the continual dripping of water. Jesus is the rock of all the ages. And for all these ages and for eternity, his patience for his sheep will hold true and firm. That is who Jesus is. That is what Jesus does. And the only way the world will know that such a thing even exists is if the church of the perfectly patient Savior screams that message unadjusted, uninterrupted, unqualified, unfiltered from the rooftops and the mountaintops. Beloved, Jesus Christ displayed his perfect patience in the text as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Did you know that? Did you know that when Jesus saved a man like Paul, he was trying to show you and me what he is like? The example of patience in this text is not an example here set forth for us to follow and emulate. Even though patience is a fruit of the Spirit, here, this is not the kind of example here that's being put forward for you and I to emulate. This is an example, the example here is the living picture of what the gospel proclaims to sinners. Grace, mercy, and love that washes over them with perfect patience, which is just the kind of patience sinners need because we will continually fall short of God's standard. So if the patience for us isn't perfect, how are we going to make it? Jesus wanted us to know how patient he is with even the worst of people that call out to him for salvation. Paul is saying, look, if I can be saved, anyone can. Why, why, why is this statement here? Why is it in 1 Timothy chapter 1 that Paul refers to himself as the chief of sinners? Because again, he doesn't say that's what he was. He says that's what he is. What he was is in verse 13. What he is is in verse 15. That's how he sees himself now is verse 15. That's amazing. He says, I'm worse, I'm worse than everybody I listed in verses 9 and 10. We, we, we love to set ourselves over against people like he described in 9 and 10. That's how we feel righteous. Well, I'm not that. I've never done that. Then you have Paul saying, yeah, I, I didn't either. I'm worse than they are. Paul wants the false teachers in Ephesus who, remember, keep speculating. Like, again, you speculate when you don't have all the answers, right? That's why you speculate, because you need to. Speculation about what God accepts, who God will forgive, what the gospel is. It, there's no speculation required. There's no questioning, no wondering. Paul wants the false teachers in Ephesus who keep speculating about how through devotion and obedience and commitment to the law and study of the law in the old way, how through those things people can live up to God's standard. He wants them to know and the people listening to them, being deceived by them to know that God is actually in the business of being patient with people that can't get it right. Sinners. That's what the message is, or that's who the message is for. What the message needs to be for God's people is, listen, in your ongoing imperfection, he is not going to cast you aside. 
He doesn't deny that we sin. He doesn't deny that we struggle. Paul never downplays sin as though it isn't horribly serious. He simply says, in the midst of your ongoing struggle, Jesus will never stop being patient with you. Talk about that and stop speculating on things that cause fear rather than give assurance. Hearing that, receiving it, embracing it, proclaiming it, all depend on seeing yourself as Paul does. Not as someone that through their works and performance can become more acceptable to God, right? So the message can't be out of the church. It can't be you got to do better, try harder, right? That's all we hear. The law is everywhere. It's in the church. It's everywhere, though. Society has law. And so we hear it out there, we hear it in here, we just think, well, you're by the Holy Spirit, I can do those things. What's the difference on the outside between that and like Dr. Phil? It's the same principle. Do better, try harder, be a better dad, be a better mom, be a better teen, be a better kid, be a better worker, get better, get better, get better, get better, get better. And Jesus says, I'm patient with you. Relax. I'm patient. The times when I don't blow it with my kids. What I want them to know is that I will be patient with them. Right? You will always have a home. That's what I want them to know. I'm not banking on my kids and not messing up. It doesn't enter the conversation. I just, I, do I want them to mess up? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, my goodness, no. The last thing I want is for them to learn through experience how much your sin can mess you up. That's the last thing I want them to learn. But I know what we are and that not messing up is impossible. So really what I want them to know is, look, you may blow it. I'll be right here. I'll be right here. And if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more the patience of Jesus for his people? My patience is worth about a dollar on a really good Friday. His is perfect. Perfect. I lost my place. It was time for that awkward silence where the pastor tries to figure out where he was. Why are we all obsessed with looking like someone that doesn't need Jesus? Why is that the goal? Like you needed the gospel then. You don't now. Maturity in the faith means becoming more aware of our wretchedness and unworthiness. It's, it's not necessarily that we're doing more things wrong and doing more active wickedness that makes that true. What makes it true is closeness to Jesus where the light is shining on any and all of the darkness in me and I realize I'm way worse than I thought when I was contrite. It may be that there's a lot of dirt. His patience is perfect. We need to get more truthful about how desperately unable we are to meet God's standard. That's how you, you because I, I don't know of anyone that would have questioned Paul's faithfulness and when he said, I'm the chief of sinners, would have said, wait, are you serious? You're the chief of sinners, what am I? Paul ends his life saying this about himself. He's very close to the end here. Do we talk like Paul? Right, because there's no caveat here. I'm a sinner, but boy, I'm not as bad as I used to be. Paul says he's gotten worse. 
right? Again, verse 13, I was a horrible sinner. Verse 15, now I'm the worst of all of them. It's being said here in this context because this is the way those who are growing closer to Christ talk. Paul needs Timothy to know this is what we need to sound like. Not like we think we can do better, like the speculators are talking. We don't talk like that, Timothy. This is the way those who are growing closer to Christ talk. This is how the church needs to talk. That should, staying that statement shouldn't be a stretch for anybody. None of us should be able to look in the mirror and say, I'm the chief of sinners and think, but I mean, am I? We are not the people that display their goodness to the world in hopes that the world will see that and want to be like us. We are the people who show that God is patient with wretches and shows them mercy and washes over them in Christ with grace and love and faith and mercy. And the busy little bee shearing the sheep in Ephesus with speculation about how everyone should be living, they need to hear and submit to the saying that is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, to the saying that God has clearly made known and should simply be believed in faith so that no speculation about what he does and who he does it for is needed. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Period. Ask yourself, who's that message for? Who needs to hear that? Anybody that sins. Because Paul is making it very clear that it's sinners that say it best to other sinners. Paul didn't like to brag about his maturity and his development and his growth. He counted it all as loss and rubbish. He liked to talk about Jesus saving sinners. Again, Christ crucified, not us improved. That was the message. If we think that we're something else, we, we, the message is ill-suited for us. Right? God found the worst sinner to make this message crystal clear. The trustworthy saying the church in Ephesus needs to hear then is that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. It's, it's almost like Paul's concern is that the people that are going to be fooled by these false teachers are gonna start thinking they're not sinners. Maybe they were sinners, or maybe they still struggle sometimes with sin, but their story becomes, their life becomes about their own development. And Paul is saying, no, 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 this is how we talk. This is what we believe about ourselves. Focusing on your own performance, beloved, it will make us forget what we are. It'll make us forget who we are. It doesn't mean the spirit is not at work so that we are purified. It does. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the spirit is doing it. Righteous living is the fruit of the spirit, not the fruit of my effort, not the fruit of my commitment, not the fruit of my devotion. It's the fruit of the spirit. What does the spirit do? He testifies to me that I belong to Christ he seals me, right? That's what the Spirit does. He teaches me of who Jesus is. He points me to the truth. We don't want to forget how it is that we've been welcomed and accepted by God. And it, look, saying this, Paul is not wallowing in guilt. He's not wallowing in self-despair. This isn't a letter from Eeyore, right? Please tell me you... you you get the Eeyore, like Winnie the Pooh's depressed donkey friend, right? All right, I'm chief of sinner. That was free. The imitation of Eeyore was free for you this Sunday. Once again, if you're visiting with us, thank you for being here to hear me imitate Eeyore. But we, we, we're not wallowing in guilt here in this statement, in this belief about ourselves. We're not wallowing in despair it's not said as though we have no hope and we don't know what's going to happen to us and all we can ever be is just rotten then. No. 
Look, look at where this truth, this reflection, look at where it leads Paul. Not to despair, not to carelessness about his sinfulness. It leads him to worship. Worship. Theologically sound, thick, deep worship. Isn't that what everything is for? So the people will worship God, then preach the gospel. You see verse 17, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's where it ends. That's where the testimony ends. Not to be continued, because I don't know how I'm going to do, but to worshiping God in his son, Jesus Christ. When Paul remembers, what, what, is, what has caused this? Well, he's remembered how patient Jesus is with him. Well, isn't that kind of base level? Like that's not really going to lead to that mature, informed, educated worship. No, no, no. It'll lead to perfect worship. He remembers the patience of Jesus with him. He remembers the mercy that has been poured out on him, the grace and love and faith that have overflowed on him, the gift of eternal life that he himself has received. He exalts the king who gave all of it to him. The king who also happens to be, by the way, the only God. It is not self-reflection or investigation that leads to this kind of worship. It's not speculation. These songs of praise happen when everything we are and everything we were are swallowed up and seen through pure grace. The glory of the God who is is pointed to most clearly when the grace of that God in saving us is the reason for considering him. If we want people focused biblically on God, we must focus mainly on his patience and his mercy toward us. The redeemed sinner is the one with a song that magnifies God as who he's revealed himself to be most clearly. The, the little believing girl in Somalia that might have a Bible will never be able to go to a bookstore or a conference or a webcast or a class is as saved and secure and heaven bound and perfected and righteous as those of us who have far too many of those things. Because Jesus is perfectly patient with sinners. Notice how God's personal involvement and action in the life of Paul leads to speaking about God in these awesome, transcendent terms, eminent terms, I should say. Grace lifts up the heart's affections so that we marvel at God for who he is in a way that nothing else can lift up our affections to do that. Beloved, God is chosen to reveal himself mainly through the mercy of his perfect patience, which is personified and demonstrated in his son, Jesus Christ. It's the one that's like that, that says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This text is here so that the church will learn how to articulate its message, right? He is the king of the ages. That's who we're talking about here. Who sovereignly governs over every age before creation, which is what that means, after creation, to the final age, on into eternity, Lord of all of it. He is immortal. He's not subject to decay or destruction. He's invisible. The physical eye can't see him. He's too high, too holy. Only in the Son will the Father ever be seen. And he's the only God. Only he is what he is. And what led to such high theology? A reflection on his patience and mercy. Right? Grace correctly shapes theology because it's the primary way God has chosen to reveal himself. Start there. Right? Paul's salvation is the picture of what the church is called to proclaim. That's what he's saying here. How it's called to proclaim it and why. God's reason for Paul's conversion is the basis for Timothy's charge in Ephesus. Finally, 18 through 20, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, 
in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. That charge Paul entrusted to Timothy back in verse 3, right, that he silenced those who teach different doctrines than what were given to the church by Jesus and his apostles and try to get people devoted to speculation on the law and myths and genealogies, endless talk. Like a father to a son, Paul entrusts that charge to Timothy because Timothy is just like Paul. I said, Timothy doesn't hear Paul say this and think he can't relate. With the approval and witness of the church in the past, Timothy had been ordained by God, set apart for the task of proclamation. Probably in Acts 16, 1 through 3, we're reading about that to some degree. Remembering that, that God was with him in the beginning, will strengthen him as he fights this battle. Remember that your place in this, Timothy, has been confirmed. You belong here. Wage the good warfare. That's what this is. It always is. This message declares war. It creates war. It fights war. It's Paul that makes this a warfare issue, not me. He describes Timothy's charge in these terms. He makes it that serious. Fight this war, he says, holding faith in a good conscience. See, that's how much, that's the degree to which the gospel will be opposed in the church. That's the context. It will be a war in the church, Timothy. The preaching pastor we find here lives by faith. He doesn't live by subjective opinions, by speculation, by self-discovery, by constantly having to discover new things and novelties for his people. He lives by faith. It's faith, which as Paul has revealed, has Christ and his perfect patience as its object that purifies and solidifies his conscience. Right? How, how, how does a pastor get a clean conscience for the sake of preaching? He focuses on the perfect patience of Jesus. Because if he's focusing on his own performance, every time he gets up here, he not only has to whip himself into shape, he's got to whip you into shape. And that's not what we are called to do. Because speculation, trying to live by what he can discover on his own, by his own devotion or wisdom, that will shipwreck his faith and others. That's what we're reading here. It's how big of an issue this is. Timothy is in need of more faith in his life. Of what will keep Christ and his work front and center in order to complete his charge. The war for the gospel, again, in the church, the war for the gospel can only be fought with the gospel. We don't normally think about going to war for the gospel in here, right, among professing believers. And yet Paul talks like this is the front this is where the battle rages the most violently. Well, that makes sense if you read through the passage that you can be dedicated to God to the degree that you don't mess up that much and be a blasphemer. Try to convince somebody that thinks they are on God's side that they're working against him. They might stone you to death for it. The war is in here. Some have swerved from this in the church. Remember verse six, by rejecting the necessity of gospel exclusivity, where the focus is on Christ through faith that brings a good conscience, rather than reliance on one's performance and obedience to bring a good conscience, where the focus is on me, Christ will be rejected. The trouble will be, the big danger is, is that we won't say he's been rejected. Paul mentions two men that he presumably had removed from the membership of the church and had in effect handed them over to Satan to be their Lord since Jesus isn't good enough for them in the hopes this will wake them up and bring them back. Enough blasphemy in the church, Paul says. Right? You can get removed from the church over this. 
Enough blasphemy in the church. Enough rejecting Christ in the church, Timothy. I've had it. That's what Paul is saying. Enough of things other than the trustworthy saying that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners in the church. Right? Who would presume on God that we know better than he does what people need to hear? There's a name for such arrogance in the face of truth. It's blasphemy. What sinner thinks they don't need more gospel? By rejecting Timothy's God-given authority, his teaching that came directly from Paul, who received his directly from Jesus, some in Ephesus are making shipwreck of their faith. That's what Paul calls it. God hadn't given Timothy anything to say but what Christ had said himself through Paul. That is why Timothy had the authority to charge those speaking a different message to be quiet. It didn't derive from Timothy. It derived from the word. And that is why he had to command them to be quiet because this is a war. You don't let enemy truth, false truth into the camp to deceive the soldiers. This is a war for the salvation of sinners inside the church here. Because that's who Jesus came into the world to save. The message of the church is one for sinners. When people forget or don't think that's what they are, the message changes. And you and I don't have the authority or permission to change the message. So the war wages on, which is why by the power and leadership of the Holy Spirit, this text has been watched over for 2,000 years so that we have the pastoral letters for us here at Moundsville Baptist Church in 2020. The church has been entrusted with the gospel because Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and the gospel does that. The gospel fits the reason for which Jesus came into the world, which is what the gospel is anyway. It's very simple, right? The law will not do that. And we don't just split hairs when we devote ourselves to such things or in the process of making shipwreck of our faith when we devote ourselves to something other than the gospel. Beloved, people will be destroyed. Their ship will wreck if we leave behind the necessity of a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Verse five, that remember are the result of believing the source of my salvation and eternal life are actually God's perfect patience, not my actions. The issue here, the reason for Paul's testimony in this letter, right? what does Paul's salvation have to do with the issue Timothy is facing in Ephesus, is to answer the question, how does, since people in the church keep not being perfect and not getting it right, how does an infinitely holy God act towards those who act ignorantly towards him in unbelief, which is what sinfulness finally is? Well, he has mercy on them. That's what he does. In Christ, God has decisively acted to display his perfect patience with even the foremost of sinners. This is the message the church needs because the people in the church are still sinners. Paul is giving Timothy this message to proclaim to the church. So there's no difference then between what the church proclaims to the world and what the church proclaims to the church. There's no difference between what the church needs and the lost need. And it's described in terms of a war because people's souls are at stake. Through his mercy, Jesus wants the world to know how patient he is with the worst of us. That is why the church exists. And anything in the church that would threaten the clarity or purity of that message must be silenced or people will be destroyed. Struggling believers don't need to speculate on how they can better obey the law in order to mature. They need to remember how patient Jesus is with people who constantly struggle and disobey and lack faith. We do not preach ourselves we preach Christ and him crucified. The church of Jesus Christ is not here to teach the world to be good. The church of Jesus Christ is here to prove to the world through the law of God that it isn't good, but that the God whose law we are constantly breaking, who happens to be the only God, is merciful to lawbreakers. 
That's the Savior's level of patience. And it's suited for the worst of sinners. If the church departs from that, if the church decides what's needed is more knowledge about the law and the old way, which is very fun to study, the ships of people's souls will crash on the rocks of their own performance and confidence. Beloved, we were meant to come to the end of our days having given up every last shred of confidence in ourselves. Not so that we would be people who have no confidence, but so we'd be people that have perfect confidence that Jesus has been, is, and will always be enough. Creating that confidence in the hearts of believers should be the goal of the church. It is not our quest to make people doubt their salvation. No child of God, I'm gonna say this, I have another paragraph here and I'm done, okay? This is very long, I'm sorry, but I'm not so sorry I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> I get a chance to be with people at the end of their lives a lot, right? No child of God should come to the end of his or her life wringing their hands, wondering if they've done enough. No child of God should live in a constant state of guilt and fear. We are not destined for shipwreck, but for salvation. If the steady message of the church makes you constantly doubt your salvation, because it's more about speculation regarding how you should live, rather than living by faith in what Jesus has done, then we aren't preaching the gospel as the power of God for salvation. We're preaching you as the power of salvation. The Holy Spirit will do the work of conviction through his word. The law will sink your ship. Jesus Christ has perfect patience with sinners. And perfect patience is the only patience sufficient to save sinners because sinners are wretched. There isn't a different kind of sinner. There's another name for sinners, wretches. That's, how, that's a statement about how holy God is. It's not a statement about what you might do or not do. We have broken God's law so much and so badly and continue to do so that we not only have no hope of salvation in ourselves, we're guaranteed intolerable retribution if there is no substitution for us. But thanks be to God for his son, Jesus Christ. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. You are welcomed around this table, sinner, because that's all there is around it, except the one sitting at the head. Come to Jesus. We don't have invitations right now. If you need to know him, I'm here. Come and talk to me. Talk to anybody in here. You don't have to say the right words. You have to believe in the right person. That he lived the perfect life for you as a substitute of righteousness for you. That he died a sacrificial death and his blood is sufficient to cover your sins, and that he rose victorious from the grave on the third day and lives now to be your Lord and your Savior with perfect patience for you. You believe in that, and he will be yours, and you will be his forever. Whether you believe it, watching this on YouTube, sitting in your pew, or coming forward, he is perfectly patient with sinners. Let's pray, and you'll be dismissed. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your patience. My goodness, Lord, we wouldn't be here. None of us, no one would be here if it wasn't for this. And I know we all know this, Father. But write it on our hearts again this morning. Let us not forget. Watch over your people as they go. Bring souls to salvation. Make Christ known to each one of our hearts as perfectly patient. And we ask and pray these things in his name and for his sake in our midst. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed, everyone. Thank you for coming this morning.